In the summer of 1994, a game developer named Naughty Dog starts working on a 3D platform game, which at the time is only referred to as the Sonic's Ass Game. Many different titles are thrown about, such as Wes, Wezzy, and Willy Wombat. Eventually, the company decides on a name, Crash Bandicoot. Crash Bandicoot is released in the United States in the September of 1996. The game becomes widely popular among audiences and served as the kickstarter to Naughty Dog's career. Rumors of a sequel start to spread almost immediately after the release of Crash, and in June of 1997, Naughty Dog would show their hand at E3. In November, Crash Bandicoot 2 Cortex Strikes Back is released. The game is met with endless amounts of excitement and praise, and is to this day considered by many the best of the series. Naughty Dog adds even more with the third game, Crash Bandicoot 3 Warped, released in November of 1998. This game would serve as the finale to the Crash Bandicoot trilogy. However, Naughty Dog's contract with Universal would not end until January of 2000, so Naughty Dog still had time for one more game, and their game of choice was... A kart racer? Now, if Crash 3 took a step backwards, then Crash Team Racing jumped a fucking light year ahead. This game is fantastic. Not only is this the best game in the series, but it's also my second favorite game of all time. Wait, wait, uh, okay, I'm sorry, um, all time? Yeah, all time. This game is number 2 out of fucking 1170 to 4012. It's just so fucking Okay, wait, let's slow down. Perhaps I should explain. Now, one would expect that a kart racing game made by a company whose only experience was platform games would turn out to be substandard at best. But if Mario taught us anything, it's that if you can make Goombas squeal, you can jump behind the wheel. <laughs> However, Naughty Dog not having experience with making a kart racer turned out to be an advantage for them. Similar to how the people who made Goldeneye for the N64 never made a game. Naughty Dog's CTR would feature many elements that make it stand out from the crowds of Mario Kart clones, the most notable of which would be the addition of an adventure mode. The adventure mode actually serves as the story mode, so this is the obvious place to start. Crash and friends are competing in a kart racing competition. The winner of the race will receive a prize. An alien sees the race going on and wishes to compete. This alien is Nitrous Oxide, who claims to be the fastest racer in the galaxy. He goes all over the galaxy and challenges people to races. He has now come to Earth and has challenged Crash and his friends. Oxide also threatens that if he is not defeated in a race, that he will TURN YOUR ENTIRE GLOBE INTO A CONCRETE PARKING LOT AND MAKE YOU MY SLAVES! <laughs> GET READY TO RACE FOR THE FATE OF YOUR PLANET! Fucking awesome. So, instead of contacting the military, they accept Oxide's challenge, and all the racers gather together to compete for the fate of their planet. Now that we got our story out of the way, we can discuss the adventure mode. When we start up a new game, we are brought to the character selection screen. Here we get to choose from 8 characters. We get Crash, Coco, Cortex, Engine, Polar, Pura, Tiny, and Dingodile. Each of the characters have 3 listed stats next to them. Speed, Acceleration, and Turning. Who you pick is important, as each of them control differently. Characters like Polar have really tight turning, but also lack in speed. Characters like Tingledile have really good speed, but also aren't good in moving around tight corners. I usually play as Cortex, but I thought I'd play as Engine this time. So we tick our name in and we're brought to the world map. Uka Uka greets us and tells us a bit about how the map works, and then we are ready to play. The map contains four tracks, although two of them are locked. You can unlock the other tracks by gaining trophies, which you earn for finishing a track in first place. So anyway, let's dive into the first level, Crash Cove. One of the first things you're probably going to notice is that this game looks a lot like Mario Kart. This game was criticized when it came out for being a Mario Kart clone. At the same time, it was also considered the best of the Mario Kart clones. This is because CTR, while taking obvious inspiration from Mario Kart, has plenty of its own original content and features that wouldn't be added until later Mario Kart installments. One notable feature of CTR is its incredibly tight controls and wide variety of techniques that can be utilized to maximize your racing experience. Wow, I sounded really smart for a second. One interesting feature of CTR is the ability to make your kart hop. By pressing R1, you can bounce. If you time your jump accurately by doing it off the edge of a steep cliff, you'll be rewarded with a big boost once you land. 
However, there are many other ways to get boost aside from jumping. You can also boost by riding over a boost pad, picking up a boost from an item crate, or using an advanced technique called power sliding, more on that later. Throughout the tracks, there are item crates scattered everywhere. In these crates, you can find all different types of items. You can get TNT crates, potion beakers, and many more. The item system works similar to the likes of Mario Kart. Players in the back are given better items, and players up front are given standard items. You can get masks, which double your speed and make you invincible. You can get the warp ball, which tracks down whoever's in first place. Missiles, bowling bombs, you name it. However, something interesting is that your items can be upgraded mid-race. Let me explain. Throughout the tracks, you can find item crates, but also wampa crates. Wampa crates will randomly give you a number of wampa fruits, ranging from 5 to 8. When you collect 10 wampa fruits, you'll become juiced up, and all of your items will become more powerful. The more friendly TNT crates can be bounced off your head by mashing the R1 button, and the more deadly Nitro crates cannot be touched at all, or else they will immediately explode. It does an excellent job of adding an element of challenge to this game, and guess what? This is one of the hardest games, but not the hardest, in the series as well, but we'll get into more of that later. After completing the four tracks on the map, a boss opens up. Bosses? In a racing game? Interesting. This game features bosses, and each of them find an irritating way to take advantage of you, usually by abusing shortcuts or throwing items behind them. It may look easy from the footage that I'm showing you, but remember, I've had this game for 11 plus years. For someone who is new to this game, these bosses can be a real pain in the ass. The challenge feels welcomed, though. It doesn't seem excessively difficult like Warp's Time Trials or Bash's... well, just Bash in general. After defeating the first boss, we obtain a key. Now we can open up another world. And guess how many worlds there are? FIVE! Fuck yes, we get five worlds to explore around in. Four of the worlds are your standard races, but the fifth one is special and we'll discuss it later. After completing each race and gaining the four trophies of that world, you will fight the boss. After defeating the boss of that world, you will earn a key, which you can use to open the door to the next world. After you get all four boss keys, you get to race Nitrous Oxide. And let me politely point out that this boss is- This boss is ridiculous. If you want to even hope of beating him, you need to abuse the power sliding technique. But, wait, 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 let me guess. Like its predecessors, CTR doesn't end immediately after you defeat the final boss. Da 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 da. Well, fuck off, because it ends immediately after you defeat the final boss. I give this game a 1 out of 7. Good night. Crash Team Racing, like its predecessors, offers tons of replay value. One of the reasons why I think this is the best Crash game is that it offers more replay value than any, and I mean any, of its predecessors or successors. After gaining the boss key in a world, the other levels in that world will open up again and you are given two new challenges. The first is called a CTR challenge. In CTR challenges, you need to find the hidden C, T, and R levels hidden in each area. After you gain all of the letters, you will need to finish the race in first place. This can prove to be quite challenging for two reasons. One being that some of these letters are a bitch to find. And even if you can find them, getting them can still be a pain. Specifically the C in Engine Labs and the T in Tiny Arena. Also, the AI is much more refined here than in the trophy races, so even if you're able to get all the letters, you still have the challenge of winning the race. When you finish a CTR challenge, you are awarded a token, which can be colored red, green, blue, or yellow. However, you can also find purple tokens by racing in arenas. In arenas, you need to collect the 20 crystals before time runs out. This is often easier said than done, and if you don't form a good path for yourself, this can often take quite a few tries. I found myself just barely getting through some of these. When you complete an arena challenge, you are awarded a purple token. After you get all four tokens of a color, a warp pad opens up on the fifth map, which takes you to a gem cup. In gem cups, you compete in the four levels that you got the tokens of that color in, or in the case of the purple gem cup, you race against the bosses again. After completing the gem, you are awarded the gem of that color. Gems contribute to unlocking new characters in the game's other modes, which we will discuss later. Gems also contribute to unlocking a secret track named Turbo Track. In addition to the gems, you also get to compete for relics, and this time, it doesn't suck! In relic races, you ride around on the track and break time crates. Sound familiar? Time crates will freeze the clock for either 1, 2, or 3 seconds. After you complete the race, you are awarded a relic depending on your time. If you did well, you get a sapphire, if you did good, you get a gold, and if you did really good, you get a platinum. However, you aren't going to need to abuse glitches to get the Platinums this time. If you break all the time crates in a track, 10 seconds are subtracted from your total time. And I love the relics in this game. The relics work and don't feel out of place. They work here because Crash really feels like he's rolling around at the speed of sound. <laughs> In the case of Warped, everything was all stop-and-go traffic style. 
wait for enemies that can't be worked around, collect 25 more relics than you should be required to earn, yada yada yada. In this case, Crash feels fast. The relics work. The Platinums don't feel absurd, they feel challenging. Now there's a definite way to earn Platinums, but it still isn't easy. It's challenging, but not tedious. Something that Crash 2 achieved, and something that this game mastered. After earning all 18 relics, including the ones in the hidden Turbo Track and Slide Coliseum, we get to race Oxide a second time. After we defeat him, we get the true ending. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you next time. But wait! There's more! Oh, and there is so much more! Stepping outside of the adventure mode, we're given even more options to choose from. In arcade mode, we can race on the tracks just for fun. We can also race as the characters we unlocked for completing the gem cups. We can also compete in arcade cups, in which after completing them in first place, we will unlock new arenas for the game's battle mode. Then there's time trial mode, and this is where the insane challenge of this game really shines through. If you race well enough on a track, you unlock Entrippy's Ghost. You need to race against Entrippy's Ghost, and if you can beat his ghost, then you unlock Oxide's Best Time. And no task in the history of games I've ever played has been more fun but also simultaneously frustrating as beating Oxide's Times. Oxide's time in this game are insane. If you want to have a chance of beating him, you need to abuse your power sliding technique. The power sliding technique is interesting, as it allows you to infinitely boost. What you need to do is jump and turn on your side, and then you'll start drifting. When your exhaust turns black, hit the L1 button. You can do this three times in a row, but just using this technique isn't enough. You'll need to cut corners, abuse shortcuts, and use even more insane tactics. Let's talk about the tracks for a second. This game's tracks are designed so well. They were obviously designed with the idea of power sliding in mind. Almost all of the tracks have unique shortcuts. Ones that don't have shortcuts usually have tight corners that can be cut around. But there is even more! This game also features multiplayer. Yeah, that's right, multiplayer, in a crash game. You and the victim of your choice can compete in arcade races or cups against AI via split screen. Or, if you're one of the seven people in the world to own a multi-tap, you can play with up to four players in the versus mode, which removes the AI completely and just has you racing against your friends. There's also battle mode, in which you can ride around on the arenas in the adventure mode, or in the new arenas you unlock by completing the arcade cups and using items against each other. I don't have a multi-tap, so I don't have footage for the four-player multiplayer. I have played the four-player with my brother and my friend John, who you might know if you watch my Let's Plays, on my PS3, and it is tons of fun. In addition to all this, this game also sports some very good graphics. For its time, these graphics are outstanding. There's a very clear attention to detail, and it's more evident here than any of its predecessors. The models on the cards don't look the best, but to be fair, the models had to look downgraded due to the limitations of the PS1, as full 3D models would be too much for the PS1 to handle. Hey, at least they didn't use cardboard cutouts. And the soundtrack in this game is excellent, far superior to Crash 2 and 3's. It's much better than Crash 1's soundtrack, and by soundtrack I mean industrial noise. All of the music is upbeat and fast, there's never a dull moment in the soundtrack, each song is upbeat and memorable. My favorite song would have to be either Tiny Arena or Cortex Castle. Crash Team Racing is the must-have game in the collection. This game is nearly flawless. This game is far superior to any of its predecessors or successors. Even if you don't like racing games, you need to get this game. From the excellent graphics, the awesome soundtrack, the memorable cast of villains, the ridiculous amounts of replay value, and the addicting multiplayer, this game is phenomenal. And now, I'm sure you all saw it coming, so I give Crash Team Racing a 7 out of 7. <laughs> this game was released in time for the Christmas of 99, but Naughty Dog's contract is going to end only one month later, meaning they won't have time for another game. So, the next Crash game, if there even is one, is going to be developed by a different company. Join me next time for when I review Crash Bash.